We all live in the digital world. We all need it to be open and safe. We all want to trust. And to be trusted. We all despise control. And desire freedom. We, we are all united. united. Welcome to the last day of the IGF. This is the workshop on critical times, impact of digitalization on climate change. Now, I don't know if any of you have been going to any of the environment sessions. We've heard from the PNE, the Policy Network on Environments yesterday twice. And there's other workshops that have been talking about this very important topic. Here, we're looking at digitalization on climate change. And although there's been a significant decline in carbon emissions in 2020, it was obviously a result um, of the population confinements during the pandemic and also the uh, global economy slowdown. Experts forecast that uh, the carbon emissions will rapidly bounce back to its original level, which is pretty sad for us, uh, because digital activity has been accelerated by the pandemic, for example, through online learning, uh, remote working, people working from home offices, and of course, you know, online shopping, things that we do, we click through every day. In this workshop, we'll be looking really at two main things, how we can measure impact um, and also how to increase awareness and proactiveness amongst uh, policymakers and developers. These are really important things. We are at a critical time for digital communities to reflect on and monitor the expansion of the internet. And we need to connect that with the carbon footprint initiatives to develop concepts, tools, and of course, internet governance policies to tackle uh, climate change and recovery plans. So we have three lovely speakers with us uh, in this workshop. First, we will hear from Edmund Chung. He's the CEO of Dot Asia organization. He will be presenting the findings of the research and present a pilot of what is called the Eco Internet Index. Next, we will go to Daphne Ma. Uh, she is the director of Asian Studies, Asian Energy Studies Center, I'm sorry. And she's also the associate professor at the Department of Geography at Hong Kong Baptist University. And from her, we will hear about the power grids and data centers and how to reduce carbon emission. And finally, we'll come right back to Karawitze. Uh, next to me, we have Teddy Woodhouse, and he is the research manager on access and affordability from the Alliance for Affordable Internet. And he'll be sharing with us the findings from the A4AI broadband policy survey, and also some policy recommendations for a greener internet. So without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Edmund Chung, who should be on Zoom with us, if he'll be allowed to share his screen. Yep. I hope I'm, my voice is coming through fine. Yes, we can hear you loud and clear. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Jen. And um, uh, as, as Jen mentioned, I'll be talking a little bit about our um, our, uh, our project this year on uh, Eco Internet uh, Index um, and some of the, the draft findings that, that we've done. For those of you who uh, joined us at uh, the APR IGF, the Asia Pacific uh, IGF, uh, we, uh, I have uh, given a preview of this uh, and we haven't quite uh, completed the, the, the work at that time, but um, I'll be repeating a little bit of that, but uh, also sharing some of the uh, findings that we now have from, from this uh, pilot uh, uh, study. So um, as a little bit of background, the, uh, the study was, uh, uh, we, we started working on this a uh, couple of years ago uh, with, the, with the concept uh, alongside APNIC Foundation. And uh, this year we've been very excited to have HBS um, uh, support our work, um, uh, funding our, our, our work uh, in this. And um, actually um, congratulations to their uh, parent uh, organization in, in Germany. Um, uh, 
But um, and this the project is also uh, supported. Uh, well, it's also related to a um, what what we call the Ajitora project, which is a tiger conservation and sustainable development project. I flip over quickly for you to to take a look, um, which we started in 2016 when the uh, SDGs were put in place. So this is an education program that we um, that Dot Asia have been supporting uh, to to support tigers, but also to uh, support uh, the, 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 the 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 education of uh, S the SDGs to, to to different schools and um, and and, and uh, uh, youth. So um, we will this project is, is a little bit uh, related to uh, uh, connected to to the the AG work that we do as well. So what what got us started really was that there there uh, in the last couple of years there has been an increased uh, interest and um, uh, I guess part partially concern as well with uh, how much the carbon footprint really is uh, from internet activities. Um, there is much talk about how how much streaming video uh, it's you know how, how many trees you're actually killing by by watching videos online and and so on. Um, and but also uh, um, looking into really what what uh, effect of, of it is uh, is the part of the project and we wanted to uh, put some data uh, well do some research on, on on the data behind it and see how much of it uh, and how much we can actually look into uh, in terms of um, how data represents the uh, um, the the actual carbon footprint of the internet and actually, you know, we, we do know that it, it, the, the machines that we run, the devices that we want run, obviously uh, uh, does, um, and does use power and that does have a carbon footprint. The question is um, what can be done and what, you know, how, how do we look at uh, what, what is actually happening? Um, we're also excited to, uh, and, and, and privileged and honored to, to have a group of advisors that, that uh, help us through, through the work. Um, from different um, different parts of the, the the community and also in the uh, the the energy and the environment uh, um, communities, as well as of course uh, from from the uh, internet governance community, especially uh, Catherine, who who is co chair for the um, uh, the the policy network for for environmental uh, environment and digital. So. Um, just going right into it, one of the first things that we looked at um, in terms of our, our, our thinking and trying to think about how users use the internet and uh, how, what kind of um, data is produced and what kind of, um, therefore, what kind of carbon footprint uh, there would be. So we first looked into uh, internet usage patterns, um, how many hours the people spent on, uh, on music, spent on videos, spent on social media, and also looking at uh, different uh, uh, activities, how they map into um, um, the kind of uh, the, the more data intensive, uh, intensive one would be video and, and so on and how, how it relates to. So um, we also selected, as this is a pilot, we also selected a few um, uh, countries and e economies in, in Asia to, to focus on uh, Singapore and Hong Kong, which sort of uh, uh, forms a, a, a relevant um, comparison. And then Australia and Japan, uh, another pair, and then India and China as a whole uh, six different jurisdictions to, to take a look at. And initially we looked at, you know, the hours spent online and uh, the 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 acceleration or, or deceleration, if you will, in some cases, um, and you know how, what the trends are there, and then we started really mapping it together um, and did a bit of a uh, calculations. Here's an example calculation of the situation in Hong Kong, for example. Um, if you look, if you take the uh, the this data on the time spent on video, social media music, gaming, and so on, you add them all up uh, and you times it from by the, the number of uh, internet users, you get a rough idea of uh, the energy consumption uh, each day for using the internet users, uh, for users on, uh, uh, in, uh, of the internet in Hong Kong. Convert that into the 
uh, the carbon footprint. And what we did was a little bit comparison with the total um, carbon footprint of Hong Kong as, uh, as, um, uh, as reported by, by the government. And what we found is that it's actually a, a relatively small uh, amount, which, is, which comes to with based on these assumptions and calculations to 0 0.4 a little bit, uh, you know, close to 0.5%. So it's a very small percent of it. But um, beyond this, what we, as we um, uh, engage with uh, uh, the, the advisors and others uh, to, get, to get some feedback, what we also uh, realize a more, more important thing is that um, it's really not just about the uh, internet's footprint, but also what it replaces, right? So all this, um, uh, uh, even if the internet's footprint is, is growing uh, at, at a, a particular pace, what it replaces potentially is, um, uh, uh, is a bigger uh, carbon footprint. Um, you know, just just look at you know the the the, the today we're using using Zoom a lot, but um, also uh, the if you if you calculate the 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 carbon footprint that we if we all fly to to Poland, not saying that's uh, you know not valuable, but just on a carbon footprint um, view, then obviously what it replaces uh, is potentially much much larger. So the question is then um, falls into another area, which is uh, when we come to think about it, um, it's really the, the, the power grid, uh, the grid that's powering the internet um, that becomes a critical component because um, that's uh, uh, the carbon footprint so-called of the internet is all based on the electronic uh, electricity power that uh, is, is generated for it. So we look at um, uh, we we started looking at the different uh, uh, scenario situations like you know uh, different countries like, you know who who emits the most um, you know uh, who has the most carbon emission and um, how do we look at uh, the, the the power grid and what it what how how it how how it contributes to to the matter and um, so we looked at studying. The, the power grid uh, indicators, the 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 um, kind of the what is called the grid emission factor, which is the the carbon footprint per uh, kilowatt of um, uh, uh, electricity generated, and how it um, uh, uh, differentiates between the, the 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 jurisdictions that we're looking at, um, as as mentioned. So then then we realize that it's it's interesting. It's not only about the um, uh, emission factor, but also um, about whether uh, uh, its its component, uh, whether it's uh, uh, using renewable source in electricity or not, and uh, we realize that this this is also a an indicator and, and component that that's useful when we think about the the issue. And then we we looked uh, based on some of the the feedback that that we got. We also um, realized that. Um, as we look at the internet bandwidth, it's not just about the usage bandwidth, it's also about the capacity. The unused bandwidth is also consuming power. In fact, uh, what we, uh, based on part of our study, we realized that the, 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 uh, the, the, the capacity itself is really the driver for, uh, if you look at the infrastructure itself, the capacity itself is really the bigger driver for uh, power consumption rather than the incremental usage uh, of your uh, video stream. It's how much capacity that is built in to your, your network that, that it, you know, is actually consuming the larger part of the, of, of the power. So, that's another part of the equation that we want to look into. And then, of course, as I mentioned, what you replace, right? Um, so if the internet is actually replacing a, a bigger part of the, the, the uh, more intensive uh, carbon uh, activities, uh, such as you know, watching a movie on, online versus driving your car uh, to the cinema and uh, watching it in the cinema, um, then we really need to look at what the digital economy, uh, you know, the, the contribution of the digital economy uh, has on the, uh, on the overall uh, GDP, if you will, or, or the economy. So these are some of the things that, that has, uh, we went through. And actually speaking about the, the network, what we also realized, as, as I mentioned, the, 
uh, if we understand that the capacity is uh, the, the bigger power co uh, um, consumption, then the variances in internet traffic plays a role in, in a certain sense, right? Because uh, if, if you have to cater for the peaks, that means, you know, during the throws, um, you know, you, there's excess capacity. Are there possibilities to, to use, utilize that uh, capacity without, um, you know, uh, 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 more intensive power consumption? That, that would actually allow us to um, better uh, make the, the internet more efficient in terms of uh, power consumption as well. So, Along with all of this, uh, what we've uh, realized, uh, and in fact, my presentation in, in, uh, at the APRIGF ended sort of here, uh, as we embarked into trying to combine those uh, indicators into a multi-factor uh, uh, index. Um, so as, as, as mentioned, they, uh, some of the things that we've realized is that it's not just the internet usage patterns, uh, but that is, of course, a, a, a part of it but the internet usage uh, needs to be related to the digital economy transformation, like um, how much of the digital economy is now part of the, the, the bigger economy. The more it converts, then you know, uh, the, the, the assumption would be, in fact, uh, even though the, the internet is, 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 is uh, 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 I guess, absolute uh, carbon footprint is enlarging, um, but the overall, um, you know, contribution to the economy would probably, uh, um, you know, be, be worth it. Um, so, so that's one axis that, that we looked into. The other axis is the energy part, uh, which is the grid emission, emission factor and the renewable sources that, that I mentioned. And then the third axis is about the network capacity, uh, the efficiency of the network and how much of the variance, if it var varies a lot, then um, there is to potential uh, excess capacity that 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 can be leveraged. Um, so these are all uh, these three axes uh, we 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 try to uh, model to to potentially give some uh, interesting ideas for for policy inter intervention as well. So first of all, I guess. Um, uh, going into each of the axes, uh, what we found, looking at the six um, uh, jurisdictions that we have, if you look at the percentage of trade uh, of the digital, you know, of, of the digital economy versus the internet's uh, carbon footprint um, as a total, uh, uh, as a percentage of total carbon emission, this is sort of the 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 situation you see. You see that um, in, in India, although it has a big uh, uh, carbon footprint, actually India has a big uh, uh, digital economy. A lot of the part of the, their economy is, is, um, is digital uh, versus Hong Kong, where it's actually a very small part of uh, Hong Kong's uh, economy or trade is in the digital economy. So, so this uh, gives you a, a better idea of how, how, how things are. And uh, part of the, the data sources that, that we drew from for, for this set uh, is, is from uh, the UNCTAD and also we are, we are social, which, which gives us a little bit of the uh, internet uh, uh, usage patterns as well. And now looking at the energy side, uh, what, what you can see is that um, uh, the renewable energy uh, percentage, um, you can see interestingly, Hong Kong and Singapore is relatively low. Uh, whereas the grid emission factor, uh, they're not as bad. One, one of the reasons, um, well, the, the, the emission, uh, grid emission factor, the longer it is, uh, the, the, the worse it is because that contains more, more carbon uh, per kilowatt hour. So um, one interesting thing that, that we also looked at is realizing that, for example, Singapore, Whereas the renewable energy percentage is, is quite um, low, what they use is uh, hydro, uh, 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 not hydro, sorry, uh, uh, natural gas. Um, and that's not a renewable energy, but uh, that you can see that the, the grid emission factor, uh, that means the grid emission factor is, uh, is, is a bit low uh, as well. So there are some nuances in it that, that as we you know, move on, we, we learn. And um, most of this uh, uh, data comes from local authorities and uh, World Bank data. 
Um, finally, the third uh, aspect, uh, which is efficiency, we looked at the bandwidth uh, uh, capacity and the bandwidth speed, um, and also the, the variance, uh, and we, we try, try to calculate that um, based on the, 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 the data from, from speed tests and, um, uh, and cable.co.uk uh, and, and ITU. Um, so, so here's a little bit of the idea. One interesting observation is that you can see that in Hong Kong, quite strangely, we, we, we probably need to take a look at that data as well, uh, is it has a huge capacity, whereas the internet connectivity speed is not, you know, not, not like uh, the, not equally as stellar. So um, it's, it's kind of interesting. And in terms of traffic variance, um, uh, if, if, you know, there, there is a similar uh, situation and also similar patterns that, that we saw as well. So adding all this together, um, again, uh, this is a very early pilot study. So uh, the rankings and the scores, I, you know, I wouldn't spend, uh, I wouldn't really uh, say it's, you know, the it's 0 0.1 difference is, is a big uh, issue, uh, but more, more so, just um, as you, as one of the things is, is, the, is this pilot study tries to do is to I, I understand everything in a kind of a percentage form so that uh, we can actually compare uh, China with, with uh, Singapore and Hong Kong with India uh, in, in, in a way that, that, that could make sense, uh, hopefully uh, make sense so that we know, uh, you know in terms of uh, policy advocacy and, and stuff, what uh, direction we want to push for. One interesting notification note is that based on the, 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 the model that, that we tried to put together, uh, Japan seems to be pretty strong on all, all three areas and Hong Kong seems to be relatively weak on all three areas. Um, and one of the things that we, we when we plot out um, the uh, like a, a, a radio diagram, we see that um, you know there are some outliers, different countries and jurisdictions would have some of the things that are uh, they are doing better, some of the things that they're not doing as well that um, you know uh, hopefully gives some idea for uh, um, uh, where uh, uh, to work on as well. And some of the case, uh, uh, one of a few of the things that, that we are looking to do is to uh, hopefully into the future expand to some other uh, countries and economies so that we can do a better comparison across, uh, uh, across Asia. Um, we wanted, we, I think uh, going forward, we want to also look at some of the outliers, uh, especially like in, in Hong Kong, uh, some of the outliers that would give us uh, more interesting uh, uh, insight into what, it, what, what, what the data might uh, actually mean. Uh, some sensitivity analysis as well, uh, the way that we have um, kind of modeled it. Uh, and then time series, like the trend um, doing it uh, a few years, uh, doing it year in, uh, year out, and, and seeing how, how, how things change over time, I think, is going to be uh, rather interesting as well. So this really brings us to bring me to the end of the presentation. Um, there's, uh, I, I hope this gives a, 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 a good uh, idea of what we're doing and um, some of the insights and also uh, uh, some of the way forward we hope to continue to work on. But um, part of the, the, the work is also to look at the, 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 the narratives of how to talk about uh, this to, 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 to the public and to, to policy uh, people as well. Uh, one of the things that you know, I, I think we distill it really down to three areas. Um, one is to uh, for users to become more carbon conscious, to, to know that the internet does have an uh, environmental impact uh, and uh, decisions do make a, a difference. Uh, but the bigger question is really the grid um, that, that powers your internet, um, you know, uh, and also the per, uh, whether there could be policy directives to encourage uh, clean en cleaner energy for, for the network infrastructure. And then finally, the, 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 the digital economy advantage, um, what the internet replaces, uh, 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 you know, in terms of more, more carbon intensive alternatives, um, and then uh, consider uh, also how, how guidelines can, can perhaps better utilize network capacities. As I mentioned, the variance of uh, network activities gives us an opportunity to better uh, uh, um, utilize the network and therefore 
really boils down to being able to do more and uh, waste less. Um, that's sort of the, the uh, preliminary findings for this year's pilot. Um, hopefully that, that's useful and thank you. Thank you, Edmund. That was a really interesting overview of the research and I guess the preliminary, preliminary presentation of the Eco Internet Index. I, I just wanted to, to hear a little bit from you. I know you mentioned a few outliers, especially in Hong Kong. Were there any like data sets or, or data, I guess, dimensions that you wished to have looked at and it was very difficult to find? I know that for, for all of these economies and jurisdictions you looked at, it might not have been so easy to, to actually find all the relevant data. Do you think there's anything missing that we can look at in, in, further, in the further part of the study? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one of the things is um, I'll, I'll scroll back up, and and this is the the, the variances in terms of the traffic patterns. Um, we we had hoped to have the raw data, for example, for uh, to calculate the variances. Eventually, we have to on some of the occasions we have to rely on these uh, graphs and the maximum uh, and mean uh, to estimate uh, kind of uh, uh, as an estimate uh, for the variance. Um, the only uh, well, there are a, a few uh, internet exchanges that we can get the raw data from. Um, and you know those would provide us with with much better data, uh, but this is something that that I think we can improve. Um, the other thing is um, the uh, the the what what I, I've actually found very interesting is that um, the renewable energy that that I highlighted as well, um, uh, and the nuances uh, there in terms of the data from from uh, consistent data across different uh, jurisdictions on the composition of the uh, uh, of the energy uh, and the power grid and how uh, uh, it, its uh, electricity is produced i think that that would um, enhance our understanding and then of course the uh, the bandwidth part um, i think um, uh, some of the bandwidth usage uh, data uh, we take from itu is um, is not, you know, uh, it, it's, it's a bit uh, uh, strange, as I mentioned for the Hong Kong one. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure it's, uh, I'm guessing it's, uh, well, we, we assume that it's correct. Um, and I'm, uh, I, I asked around as well, there is a tremendous capacity in, in Hong Kong and that, that we know uh, versus other places. But, um, you know, over, over time, how it's, uh, the usage is for, I think, uh, would be, useful to, to get a sense, a uh, better sense as well. But overall though, I think um, what we are trying to do is based on limited um, uh, uh, data, uh, we can apply some consistent data to, to do some comparative study. Then we know what policy uh, 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 directives might be useful for different jurisdictions. Thank you, Edmund. We actually, I know you can't really see in the Zoom room, but we do have a pretty full room on site uh, in Katowice. And it's, it's really, thank you for all of you joining us here because we know the last day on the IGF first session on the last day is always a tough, uh, it's a tough sell to anyone, but I'm very glad that we do have a full room. I know we will have questions later from the audience to, to ask you about these studies. And uh, I wanna now turn over to Daphne Ma and she is joining us, I believe on Zoom and also from Hong Kong. Daphne, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much. I'm Daphne, I'm the director of the Asian Energy Studies Center uh, based in Hong Kong from the Hong Kong Baptist University. Um, thanks to the organizer and admins team for inviting us to join this uh, forum. And um, I think um, what we try, uh, what I would like to share with um, the participants in this forum is that I wish to bring in the social perspective of um, the whole um, discussion. Now, um, let me share my screen. So can everyone see my screen? Um, we can see your screen. Is it possible to? Yes, perfect. 
Okay, good. Right. So um, this source of perspectives that I would like to focus on today is about data trust. So the whole topic of um, this section is about the digital technology and uh, climate change. I think Edmund said a very good scenes for um, my presentation because um, Edmund kind of uh, identified that internet users, they are important because they drive electricity consumption changes. And that's why now we can identify that the power sector is a key area that we can do something. So uh, as Edmund mentioned that the policy solutions and what the future directions to pursue. I think um, the uh, MS um, team's findings uh, were very useful in that sense. Now, um, I think it is extremely important for MS team to identify uh, the new and important or emerging patterns of power consumptions, uh, which have been driven by internet users, especially what are the changes in those patterns uh, during the pandemic. So uh, we are facing very rapid changes, unforeseeable changes. So um, it is very important for um, this kind of study to take a very good stock of these changes. These are important because the government and business sector and civil society, we can better or more effectively identify actionable solutions. Uh, our team um, at the Asian Energy Studies Center, we focus on the uh, smart energy transitions, which are um, um, uh, enabled by the smart grid developments. Um, in other words, it's about, uh, basically, it's about digitalization of the power sector. And that kind of smart energy transitions uh, enabled by smart grid developments, we see that it is a very uh, promising solution to climate change. Um, basically, smart grid is the uh, integrating uh, ICT, information and uh, communication and technology into conventional energy system. And that is very important because it opened up two main um, approaches for possible changes. Uh, I'll see it in that way. On the one hand, we can uh, have uh, new demand side management, especially uh, demand response. For those of you, maybe you already have the smart sensors installed at your home, and then you can use your app to monitor the real-time electricity consumption. And then uh, with dynamic pricing, you can kind of reschedule uh, the time of your electricity consumption from peak time to off peak time. Now, on the other hand, for the supply side, we see that it is uh, apart from uh, digitalization of the power sector, another main um, driving uh, changes is about decentralization of the uh, conventional um, centralized energy system with uh, increasing use of renewable energy, such as um, these kind of rooftop solar panels that you can see uh, um, uh, in many, many um, urban uh, cities, including in Hong Kong. Okay. Now, with all these possible changes with uh, smart grid, uh, what we would like to emphasize is that data trust is essential to effective realization of such smart changes. And that is not easy because we see that trust is a very um, uh, difficult issue um, to deal with. Trust basically is um, something very psychological that um, is a feeling, is a psychological state that I feel okay to accept that I'm vulnerable. And then in terms of data trust, we see that these are a range of um, dimensions of data that matters a lot. Uh, we care about what data is being held, how and where it is secured, and who can access to it, and how long it will be careful, and why it is necessary to collect it, this data and keep it. Now, for smart grid development, that this is very, um, it's not uh, easy. It's because we see that um, smart development um, create a special kind of trust requirement. Uh, 
uh, because such energy transitions involve a lot of uncertainties and risks. Um, if you remember, um, at the very beginning of um, my presentation, I mentioned that demand side management is uh, good, is a possible uh, future solutions. But think about the private issues um, relating to, related to smart meters. Um, these are very real um, uh, issues that uh, governments have to deal with because it, uh, it can be a huge source of public controversies. On the other hand, for renewable energy development, of course, we know that it's, um, it's very promising. But in terms of collecting data and how to consolidate data from um, which are now in hands of different parties, then it is a huge challenge. Now, public trust is important. If we cannot build trust in data, then we see that very often uh, policies that are uh, uh, intended to support, say, for example, uh, demand side management or dynamic pricing or even renewable energy. Um, in many cases, that could cause uh, public controversies. And that means that there will be a delay in uh, policy imp implementation. Now, our research team uh, over these years, uh, we have worked on a number of projects relating to trust. Uh, the trust perspective of energy transition. And I would like to share uh, a couple of key findings uh, for the interest of time today. Uh, the first finding that I would like to share with um, the uh, participants um, is that, um, that people, the public, they concerned about trust in, uh, for many uh, reasons. Uh, with smart meter installation, some people, they are concerned about the health um, issues. Um, they also complain that uh, there um, are inaccuracies of smart meters readings, and then they are charged uh, too much from, uh, by the power companies. And some people, of course, they uh, are very concerned about privacy issues, and as well as inequity issues that uh, vulnerable groups who are not so competent to uh, use uh, smart meters of those apps, then they are put into a um, disadvantage with position with all these market changes. But the second key findings that uh, from our research I wish to share with um, you is that uh, about who to trust. We find that, uh, for example, from this uh, survey in Hong Kong that we conducted um, last year with um, about uh, 170 Hong Kong people. Um, we find that the trust level of all governments, as you can see um, from uh, 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 the Chinese government, Guangdong government and Hong Kong government, uh, you see that the red bars indicate um, the, the the level, the scale of the distrust. And then on the other hand, the business sector, as you can see from the first set of those bars, that um, for the major utility in Hong Kong, the green bars, they are um, really uh, 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 it, it dominating. So uh, we see that Hong Kong people, they, do, they did have greater trust on the power sector in Hong Kong. Um, this is another set of data that we got from another study. Uh, another uh, telephone survey that we just completed a couple of months um, uh, earlier this year, that we find that um, there are, as you can see from the diagram on the left-hand side, uh, we asked people, uh, would you welcome if the government collects my personal, your personal data. And you see the web bars are quite uh, um, um, uh, visible here. So you see that the distrust on government actually is quite um, uh, uh, discernible here. Uh, but on the other hand, if we see that uh, that is uh, one interesting findings of our observation that uh, I'd like to share as well is that um, that is what we call a divided trust. 
across different generations in Hong Kong. As you can see, the young people in Hong Kong, um, they tend to be uh, more skeptical to the government. But for those in uh, middle age or um, in, in, uh, the more el um, in the elderly group, they were, uh, they find the government a little bit more trustworthy. Okay, now another key question is that if the government um, did not have a high level of trust from Hong Kong people, so how about the private sectors? I think that is a good news for the private sector because from uh, our study, we find that uh, the companies in general, they get a higher level of trust from the Hong Kong people. But across the uh, business sector, we can differentiate the types of com uh, companies. And um, we find that the foreign funded companies, as you can see on the left-hand side, the, uh, the diagram on the left-hand side, they enjoy the highest level of trust among the people. But the Chinese funded companies, they um, were less uh, trustworthy um, companies group in Hong Kong. For locally funded companies, and it seems that they are like in the middle. Okay, so um, to um, the final remark that I would like to share is that uh, we see that um, that is a very important area for future research direction. That is how to build data trust, and uh, particular um, uh, that bearing in mind that uh, trust by Hong Kong uh, citizens on different groups, uh, the trust levels actually are very different. We have different trust level on government and on the corporates and on NGOs. So I think the key is that how we can uh, build data trust through multi-sector uh, collaborations. Okay, so I think that is um, all that I would like to share for now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daphne. That was extremely enlightening. I think it's really interesting that uh, you were presenting your, your data that this survey was conducted in uh, 2020, so last year, where everybody was pretty much confined in their homes. And right. also, of course, with the, the consideration of the, I guess, the political and social pressures and, and uh, differences that, that happened in Hong Kong, I guess, in recent years. So that also could have led to I guess the results and the findings of the survey. I think it's really important that you brought the the connection of trust of data here because in in the in the initial presentation from Edmund, he mentioned that this whole effort really requires multi-stakeholder, multi-sectoral, public and private efforts and especially when you're looking at the energy grid uh, that is very much um, in the domain of governments and if the government offers a solution that is not trusted by their citizens this is not going to 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 actually benefit anybody <laughs> at all so thank you daphne for for pointing that out i'm sure we'll also have a lot of questions for you uh, 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 for that and i think um it's really interesting just to see the snapshot here uh, about Hong Kong. And now we turn to our presenter in the room, Teddy Woodhouse. I think he's going to bring us, uh, he's going to touch on Asia and also bring us across the world to different, uh, different states, different countries, and give us a little bit of um, an overview about the findings of the broadband. Is it the broad, uh, the policy? broadband policy. So Teddy, the floor is yours. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so yeah. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Teddy Woodhouse at the Alliance for Affordable Internet. I'll take this off to be a bit more clear. Um, so yeah, as my slides are coming up, the kind of from our perspective as an organization, we focus on the idea that we want everyone in the world to have universal and meaningful uh, access to affordable internet. Um, so no matter where they are or what their income is, we want them to be able to use the benefits of digital technology as all of us are here, either if we're in Katowice right now or connecting in on Zoom. Um, and so where I think Edmund and Daphne's presentations have been great about thinking about these possibilities and the future of what this area is gonna look like, we wanted to focus quite clearly 
on, you know, how are we doing right now in terms of thinking about these issues and how are governments thinking about these issues? Um, so we started with kind of considering this question from the perspective of how are governments talking about this collaboration between environmental issues and broadband policy? So what this first slide here is, is it's a map of the 70 countries where we took their national broadband plan, which is kind of the highest level key document of how a government is theoretically at least, understanding ICT issues and internet issues. Um, and so we looked at these governments to see how are they talking about it um, and how are they not talking about it? And so in some ways, oh, hopefully it's gonna come, there it is. Yeah, it's lag lagging through, but um, we saw environmental themes weren't very prominent, but where they are emerging, they're limiting factors or these future possibilities of you know, utopian visions of smart everything and how this is gonna work out as a great future. Um, but we saw that energy in particular was the current kind of critical point of what we need to focus on. And so in a lot of ways, this was quite enlightening for us to think about where are gonna be some early touchstones for policymakers on these areas. It's how does energy and the internet relate to each other? Um, but one point of interest that I found quite, quite amusing and unexpected as we were going through this research was also that environmental vocabulary is quite common throughout all of these documents. And it's probably also here in, in the, the session descriptions that you've been seeing here, it's sustainable business models, it's the investment climate, it's the regulatory environment. All of these are green words that we've co-adopted into meaning things completely unrelated to their environment um, and to the actual natural world. And so we think, I think hopefully, It'll be easiest for us to keep using this language in a way that we already are, but bring it back to their original intention as well. Um, and so some, uh, uh, there's a few examples and you can read more in the report as well. Um, but I think there's some really interesting areas, particularly around Senegal, for example, I'll pull out as an example of expanding the regulator's authority to require infrastructure sharing is a great example of how governments can reduce the what's going to be the carbon footprint of new build out in new areas as we're reaching universal access. Um, if you build fewer towers, it's going to require less energy to run those towers, therefore creating a kind of a more efficient network overall. Um, and so that was the area that we focused on is if we want to think about a world where everyone has access to 4G technology, um, and we focused in our research uh, on sustainable access earlier this year on Africa, where as a from a regional perspective is where the situation is most urgent and where the greatest work is needed. Um, you can see the bending of the arc of the gray arc at the top there is if we do nothing, it's going to keep increasing. Energy demand is going to keep rising. Carbon emissions are going to keep rising. But things that we can tweak now, and if we tweak them earlier rather than later, we're going to have a better trajectory, are things like if we increase infrastructure sharing, so it's building those fewer towers I mentioned, if we increase the use of off-grid renewables, so if we use solar panels or hydropower to power this infrastructure, we see, again, um, good benefits. But the one that was actually surprisingly strong was if we simply connect a lot of these remote towers to the electricity grid. Um, and this is a huge problem because a lot of the areas that are currently underconnected or unconnected are rural and remote. They don't have access to an electricity grid. Um, and so in a lot of ways, these new towers have to be diesel generated. And so where policymakers are thinking about this and Daphne's presentation was bringing this point in quite clearly of this is a, this is a government decision where the electricity is going to, grid is going to be in a lot of ways. That, that complementarity is gonna be a huge factor and what is gonna be the ultimate kind of carbon footprint of the network that we're building here. Um, but one point of optimism that we saw in our modeling was that as more people are coming online, we see this kind of new efficiency that emerges of, if you think about what is the cost of the infrastructure from a per user perspective, it's actually looking somewhat optimistic in the sense that as we bring more people online, um, that per user cost is going to come down. And so that's also going to be a crucial thing. And why we, why we now kind of consider these softer issues of digital skills and training people how to use the internet actually has an environmental impact because bringing those more, more people on, they're going to have greater benefit and there's a greater social justification for why this infrastructure should exist in the first place. Because um, in a lot of ways, the infrastructure does already exist, but it's used quite inequitably. So it's quite used heavily in some parts of the world and not accessible at all. This is a slide meant more for reading than for uh, uh, going through right now. So I'll skip it for now, but please do read into report. This is some of the example policies that we've recommended to policymakers of ways of kind of thinking about these issues as initial starting points. 
Um, but, you know, one particular area of, of interest for us, and I wanted to just highlight some works from a friend, uh, Michael Augia, who wrote a report on filling the gap between energy and internet access. It's this idea of where can we start thinking about these complements um, and universal service and access funds, um, we think are quite a, you know, a valuable starting point in terms of the areas where these institutions are focused on, rural and remote areas, are exactly where these problems of a lack of electricity and a lack of internet access are running in complement to each other. Um, and so that, that, let me keep my remarks quite brief here as well so we can have a little bit of discussion. Um, I will apologize in advance, I'll have to leave slightly early because I'm being booked into another session. Um, but I think in terms of what's next and what's on our horizon, um, it's, it's this idea that those who are affected uh, by climate inequality, who are most vulnerable to climate change as it is right now, and those who are most vulnerable from digital inequality are fighting against the same injustice. And so it's really difficult and really problematic for us to think about those who are facing this injustice can choose one or the other. You can have a clean environment or you can use the internet, but you can't use both um, because it, it, that is simply unfair and that's not the future I want to live in. Um, hopefully it is not the future that we want to live in. Um, so hopefully we can take action now and see a better future in the new, uh, in the years ahead. So yeah, thank you. Thank you, Teddy. Yes, we are conscious also of being double booked uh, everywhere. I, I know you called out the, um, <laughs> the, the, the research, I think, article that Michael also wrote, and he was quite active in the Zoom chat saying he would wish that he was here to talk about this because it's part of his work as well, but he is moderating another session. I think this is something that we, you know, still we're not able to do. We can't split ourselves mm. physically or, well, we can do it, you know, we're here and then we can be online as well but you know we're not quite there yet with technology so in the interest of time for you as well I, i'd like to ask you a little bit more about what it is that you you think that we should do right now to to actually tell the policymakers, hey you know you need to pay attention to this how can we work towards a greener internet how can we work towards greener policy across the board yeah so what i would say is um, policymakers have a decision to make right now, and that is they can either act now or they can wish that they acted now five years in the future. Um, because the most cost effective way to greening the internet is doing it earlier rather than later. Um, and so when we've been doing estimates with the ITU on what it's going to cost the world to, you know, provide universal 4G access, it's uh, 428 billion um, for kind of the next 10 years as a horizon. If we include in that factor the idea of making the internet greener, it's going to be easier, we're going to have better results if we do it earlier rather than later and try to kind of undo the damage that we're doing along the way. Um, and so that's that's the, the crucial point I would make is if you start early, you're going to have better results and it's going to be more efficient for everyone. Thanks, Teddy. And I know I you promised us seven more minutes. So I want to see if there's anybody in the audience who has something specific to ask for Teddy before he has to run off to another session. Yes, if you can identify your name and maybe your affiliation. Hello, I'm Nagendra Lamsal, Deputy Attorney from Office of the Attorney General Nepal of Government of Nepal. And basically, I see that electricity uh, grid from renewable sources of energy, just like wind power, biomass powers, and solar powers, and green hydropower powers are basic factors to decrease the this crime, impact of climate change and make an eco-friendly environment. So as a, in the conference of party of UN, in UN Climate Change Summit also, this agenda should, we should focus to make this agenda, digitalization of climate change and environment as a major agenda in 2022 summit also. So that it can be because every nation's government delegates are participating there. This is the wider uh, summit than IGF 2021, I think that. To, make a international agenda for clean digitalization, clean environment, and for to reduce the impact of climate change. Because as a vulnerability groups, as I am from the LDC countries, there are 46 LDC countries in the world. Mm. Green emissions coming from the developing countries and developed countries affecting to the whole world. But there is a various agreement, uh, developed countries and developing countries are making that they will decrease the carbon emissions also. So now it's time to change the uh, using the digital license by making the green efforts, by making the green eco-friendly environment, eco-friendly industries, eco-friendly working places, 
eco-friendly services, eco-friendly data centers, and eco-friendly activities to reduce the carbon emissions and make a future generations effective eco-friendly environment. Mm. As I suggest that we should make a clear agendas from this IGF summit or agenda for climate change summit for next year, 2022, to make a wider discussions among the stakeholders from policymakers, developers, planners, and for various government agencies are participating in that summit. So we can make a concrete idea from here. Uh, basically, I think that every countries are, uh, they are known that the climate change impacts not only the one countries. If one country will bring uh, various impacts of climate change, it will affect the whole population of the world. So they are very much aware about this. So every country are making the policy and laws relating to it. As for my, uh, as for, as a part of the Nepal, there is also climate change policies. There is also the environment laws, which are focusing on the reducing the climate change activities. As a Nepal, you know, our Himalayan part, there's a the melting of the glacier. It makes so much difference and it impacts so much to all over the world also. So our government is so much responsible and awareness aware about to reduce how to the climate change. And it is in every forum, in every climate change summit, the main agenda of Nepal is how to decrease the impact of climate change, impact of the industrialization, impact of the other power resources, which are generating the climate change effects to reduce it. So I want to make a conclude that we should make a concrete decisions and we make uh, awareness uh, to the policymakers, planners, developers, and other stakeholders, NGOs, the community-based organizations, that we should focus on the digitalization by making the eco-friendly environment using the renewable sources of energies. We, could, we should support other sources of energy as an optional part only. So we should focus on them because renewables, uh, because main part is electricity and it is the main source for all, all activities either it's for industrialization, either it's for working services, either it is for to use the digitalization products. So we should focus on the use of renewable sources of energy and use that sources which can reduce the carbon emissions and make a concrete ideas and make a concrete policy from the Climate Change Action Summit of, uh, which is organized by the United Nations Framework uh, on Climate Change so that we may make uh, uh, relevant ideas and relevant issues we can create here so that it should be the more efficient for discussions on the Indian Climate Change Summit so that the policy changers, planners, developers can make a, a variant ideas, make a, a variant innovative innovations to reduce the climate change, uh, uh, increasing the solar, uh, using the renewable sources of energy and promoting the digitalization of eco-friendly environment. Thank you. Thank you. Teddy, do you have a response to this? Yeah, I'll try to keep brief because I can also see Edmund's uh, hand raised on the Zoom screen. Um, yeah, no, I think it's, uh, you raise a really critical point of um, how intertwined these issues are and how underappreciated how close these issues are. Um, because the countries that are currently benefiting from the, the status quo have both. And there are so many people, too many people who do not have access to either. Um, and so I actually have to compliment the Digital Nepal framework was actually one of the strongest performers of all of the 70 countries that we studied in terms of the number of times they were mentioning the keywords and these themes. And precisely it was because of this recognition of this complementarity that it was so strong performing. And so what we can do, um, just uh, I like a practical note, one of the areas of positive practice is in Pakistan and India where the Universal Service Fund has operated to say, we're gonna partner with a mobile network operator to build into a new rural or remote area. They've put in a requirement that the new towers that they build are solar powered rather than diesel powered. And so that has that crucial point of using the procurement power of government to kind of nudge things in the right direction away from fossil fuels and towards renewables in a way that I think that the accumulation of those small nudges in the right way, um, hopefully will have an impact for all of us. Thank you. Thank you, Teddy, for that. I think we all 
do well to to remember accumulation of small nudges. Um, I am conscious that you do need to run to another session. So thank you so much for being here in, in our session and also answering the question from Nepal. And the conversation does not stop here with Teddy. And we'll, we'll make sure that if you have more questions for him, his organization and on all the research and, and findings, we'll be able to get you in contact with him so you can continue to ask. And now I also want to acknowledge, of course, our uh, our lovely Zoom room. This this is a hybrid IGF after all. I think Michael Ogia, who is really a superstar multitasker since he is also moderating another session and also participating in our chat. He had a response for you. Um, Delegate from Nepal, I am sorry. Uh, and he mentioned that there is the policy network on environment that is one of the. Oh. Hello. There is somebody not muted in the Zoom room. If we can just mute. Thank you very much. Um, and he mentioned that it's a policy network on environment, which is one of the two policy networks that uh, has been uh, new this year to this IGS. So it's very interesting to see all the different uh, dimensions that they also consider and the outputs and papers that they have, have put out as well. So I'm sure Michael will be able to drop that in the chat, but if not, I'll be able to find that for you. And, and this would be, of course, uh, extremely interesting to all the participants here. So I'd like to also turn to Edmund. Oop, your hand is down, Edmund. Did you want to respond to? to I, I was uh, I was hoping to to catch Teddy before he leaves, but uh, seeing that he he's going to go, that or I don't know if you have one minute left. Uh, go for I it. Just want to, yeah. I I just um I I so I note that in your um in your presentation you mentioned that um you know the the interesting observation about having more the more users on on the network the lower uh, per user carbon emission and also the sh you know uh, you didn't go into the um, uh, the policy recommendations but uh, I, I was reading that uh, sharing of the infrastructure is is important and that that really reverberates well with uh, part of our finding about the better uh, uh, utilization and efficiency of use of, of the network itself is actually an important part of the the the, the direction uh, just was hoping if you, you you might be able to elaborate a little bit more on those couple of points. Yeah, sure. Um, I, I quickly uh, to add in on there. I think it's it, it, yeah, you're you're spot on. It's quite um, an important issue, and I think it's it, it runs in surprisingly multifaceted ways. The more you think about, it, the more layers that you get into it. Um, so thinking about it almost from that very technical perspective of. It's not just necessarily telling mobile network operators, you know, play well, play nice with each other, share towers. It's things like internet exchange points um, and having open infrastructure that is commonly used to operate this network that is going to have that positive impact for users as well. Um, because also having kind of more local content hopefully will lead to more relevant content that will create demand that's going to bring more people online. So you can hopefully have a harmonious feedback loop there as well that's um, aiding this process of both responding to that idea of ways that we bring people online um, in a way that's relevant to them and justifying the expense of this infrastructure, but also building good infrastructure that is going to be open and environmentally friendly or more environmentally friendly than the worst case scenario, which is kind of closed walls and um, kind of privatized uh, everywhere you go. Thank you, Teddy. And uh, I think now we really do have to let you run. And I think, uh, yes, I hope it's not too far from here. The venue is actually quite large. I'd like to open the floor now to any questions from our audience, either in the room or on Zoom, for anything that they wanted to ask more about to our presenters, um, Daphne and, and Edmund. I think it was quite interesting to see, I guess, a pilot part and any input or, or, or queries you might have would be extremely welcome. Anybody, do we have anybody online that would like to ask a question or in the room? 
Hi, um, I'll just have a quick question. And I'm Sonia George. I'm the executive director of the Alliance for Affordable Internet. Um, I actually have a question for Edmund. Um, I was actually curious to find out a bit more about your research um, and to what extent you are thinking of potentially using these as not just a framework for Asia and to expand within Asia, but maybe be a framework that we can use elsewhere in the world. I think there's such a um, a lack of good research in this area, you know, that's why we've also, and Teddy has been leading that work, doing a lot, but I think there's a lot that needs to be done. And so I'm just curious, how do you think it's possible, especially given the data limitations and the issues that you raised, they were totally like so important. Um, and of course, we at A4AI would love to also consider that. So just putting it out there, if you can give a quick answer, uh, and then maybe we can follow up. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you for that question. I, I, um, I think we focused on Asia because, um, uh, because dot Asia is uh, a little bit more focused on Asia. But um, the framework, we hope that it could be uh, used elsewhere. In fact, uh, we hope to, um, uh, we, we're trying to throw this out as, um, as a starting point and hopefully other, uh, other regions uh, and other area uh, um, uh, organizations from other, uh, other regions could, uh, would be interested to pick it up and even improve on it. Um, the data uh, availability is something that, that we have been uh, thinking through uh, especially to, to try to find uh, consistent data because it's only useful as comparative uh, a study if, if the data is, is somewhat consistent, right? Um, and so some of the data set, as I mentioned, is, is from ITU, from World Bank, and uh, from, from UNCTAD, uh, and so on. And they represent global, uh, uh, global data. So, so definitely, I think the the at least the uh, our starting point is to have uh, the 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 concept and the framework being able to be used in other places as well. And we try to use uh, internet uh, exchange data as well, and those would be a little bit more localized. But um, this is an area where I find quite a bit of we find quite a bit of um, uh, consistency as well. The type of data that. Um, uh, internet exchanges uh, keep and uh, and share uh, is uh, actually quite consistent across uh, across the board uh, ac across the globe. So yes, I think um, the we we do have a, a global scope in mind. But um, for Dot Asia, we started with Asia and also focus in Asia, and we're hoping that that you know in fact we we could collaborate with with others to uh, bring it bring it to other parts of the world. Um, but I, I was I wanted to also bring up that um, I, I'm just here to 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 do the presentation. The bigger part of the research um, is actually uh, Christine Christine Orr, uh, who's also online with us here from from Dot Asia. Um, uh, she has been leading the, the the research. So I wonder if uh, she wants to add something about some of the background research as well. Uh, thanks, Edmund. This is Christine. Uh, hi, everyone. So, um, as mentioned by Edmund just now, um, and also I've attended the um, PNE session um, yesterday. I think um, when we were doing the research, um, it was um, um, it was a little bit difficult when we were trying to find uh, consistent data. So uh, as mentioned in the PNE session yesterday, I think data transparency and um, the standardization of how data was is collected is is also very important uh, for our research and for us to uh, look at the issue um, like more in a more accurate way. So that's my opinion on that. Thank you. Thanks uh, for the question, Sonia, and also uh, for answering um, Edmund and, and uh, Christine. I think bringing that point up, I guess both in terms of like 
uh, looking at this just as a pilot study from Asia and seeing if there's synergies and collaborative efforts to, to look at other regions as well. I know A4AI uh, have looked at, you know, more, more global kind of, uh, uh, kind of case studies from around the different regions. And I think it would be a really good opportunity for us to see if there, there is, I mean, I, I'm sure there is, I can see very clear synergies that we can definitely cooperate. And, and I want to also acknowledge in the chat, we have a participant called Mark Urban, and he's been also asking about synergies as well. And he's brought in, you know, asking about whether or not there is a similar kind of pilot program or or interest in starting something like that in Latin America. So I, I also want to acknowledge uh, people in the Zoom. If you have any questions, feel free to use the raise hand button, which I always have a problem looking for. I think it's in the reactions part. So if you have any questions for Edmund, Daphne, or, or just generally want to throw a question to the room for us to think about, please do go ahead and do that. Oop, and as I'm saying that, I see a question pop up immediately in the Zoom room. I think this is from Theo. Theo, would you like me to read this or would you like to go ahead and take the mic? If you're not able to take the mic, I'll be happy to read it. Okay, so the question from Theo, uh, I believe she's from Myanmar. Um, she says that uh, she's curious that what kinds of further studies do Dot Asia have a plan regarding developing countries in Asia? I don't know if Edmund, if you have any response to that. Yeah, um, thank you, Vio, and um, um, uh, thank you for connecting from from Myanmar as well. I, I we 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 as we were going through uh, the initial study, I guess the um, uh, we we looked at uh, you know kind of trying to select some uh, jurisdictions to look at, and um, I, this relates back to the earlier question about availability of data, uh, and the, the reason why we chose these uh, few ones for for um, I guess the first uh, pilot study is that uh, we we were able to identify readily uh, consistent data. Uh, across and um, the challenge for uh, developing uh, countries is uh, the some sometimes is a lack of uh, that that consistent data. However, um, the the idea is that um, we um, as we were going along, we were trying to identify data sets that were really that we could actually model uh, a you know create a model that that allows us to create an indicator. So um, whereas of course. It, data is always more is always better and um, provides a better act more accurate uh, um, uh, kind of picture. However, what we are looking at is to create a framework that can actually be uh, uh, brought to um, you know now with the pilot. I think it could be brought to developing uh, uh, countries and uh, utilizing a few. Uh, data points that actually uh, what we've seen um, uh, is reported to the the World Bank data or the ITU data as well, uh, and using utilizing that as a prox uh, approximate uh, indicator uh, for what we want to think about because um, the idea is not to uh, you know uh, it, it's not that uh, we would I, in fact it's it's arguable how you determine the uh, uh, carbon footprint of the internet. But what we want to do is create a model that gives us an idea whether um, uh, things are going in the right direction. Um, I guess that's, that's really what um, Teddy also uh, mentioned. Um, and uh, and that, that in, in some ways relates to what uh, Daphne uh, mentioned. I think it's, it's very useful. We we can we can produce data we can draw data uh, but do you know how w would people trust <laughs> what what is being uh, uh, you know presented and 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 actually act on it um, that's that's going to be a, a a key key aspect but I guess back to directly on on your question Pio I uh, definitely uh, I think we we definitely have uh, we definitely hope to plan to 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 include uh, developing uh, countries. Uh, uh, in 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 the study, 
um, and uh, you know, hopefully in 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 the in the real study, as I mentioned, one of the 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 way for the 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 direction is to include uh, expand to um, many other uh, jurisdictions uh, across Asia, so that we can do a a more proper. Uh, um, sort of comparison uh, between the, the, the different countries and economies and, and how, how the direction is over time. Thank you, Edmund. Fio, I hope that answers part of your question. I think there's definite opportunities to look into the next iteration of the EII. I think uh, probably both Nepal and Myanmar could could be could be economies and jurisdictions that we could look into. You know, uh, completing this this analysis if we get the data, and we're going to try to do that. I guess for the the rest of the Asia region, as well as expand to you know collaborate with other organizations in in other regions as well. I want to turn to a question that you know I guess. Coming back to the basics, uh, I know Daphne, you were mentioning uh, uh, trust and how how important it is for for us to to trust in the data. And I want to hear a little bit from you. How 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 can we increase the awareness and proactiveness uh, amongst poly policymakers? I guess in Hong Kong, for 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 your case, how do we urge them to prioritize uh, a climate change? How do we urge them to set the goals to achieve sustainability? I think right right now, um, the Hong Kong government has already set a carbon neutral goal by twenty fifty, which is um, quite in line with the. Uh, global trends. So I think the key actually is not to set an even more ambitious goal. Of course, it, uh, more ambitious is um, always better. As Edmund mentioned, more data is always better. But I think the key for Hong Kong is that how we can really uh, deliver that promise. And then um, we see that um, there are, of course, um, many um, uh, uh, possible approaches like um, using uh, developing more renewable energy um, uh, as uh, many uh, just now participants mentioned but how to really drive um, uh, the majority of people in Hong Kong to support those new um, policy directions is the key and um, so I think um, digitalization uh, they data uh, all very critical um, building blocks for us to build the consensus in Hong Kong so that we can support or push the government to really deliver um, um, drastic or ambitious uh, policies. Say, uh, even though uh, like in Hong Kong, for us to introduce dynamic pricing to differentiate electricity price is the top number one most um, challenging task for the for the Hong Kong government. So my point is that how to build the uh, consensus, uh, especially in the face that we are digitalized. Um, we're, we're going for a smart society and then smart city and smart grids. And then um, I think we, my sense is that we are not yet fully aware of these um, uh, challenges ahead. And then we are kind of building up the understanding. And I think another point I would like to add is that uh, just now we talk about quite a lot on uh, data. We have, uh, we need data badly. That there are huge limitations for us to get good data, to consolidate data. So my sense is that um, relying on the government data sets um, uh, uh, would be uh, uh, presenting huge uh, limitations for the years ahead. So we probably need to be much more proactive to develop um, more like um, bottom up approaches for us to build the data. Say, for example, I think um, just now we touch upon a very important issue that how we can extend admin teams studies to uh, elsewhere like uh, uh, other developing countries. Um, so I think maybe one of the first points is that we can maybe identify good uh, corporate partners in different developing countries. They are big internet uh, users so that we can gradually build up a data sets which would be uh, more readily available. 
So these are just some comments that I would like to share. Thank you, Daphne. Um, I cannot stress enough the importance of data, good data, as Daphne said, and also, I guess, the transparency of, 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 of this data. If we cannot trust the data sets that we use to do this study on, then it's very difficult to, to be able to see, you know, accurate results coming out of a calculation from these data sets. That's absolutely very crucial here. I'm wondering if there's any uh, audience members either in the room or in Zoom who do have any more questions for our panelists. I'm going to give it a few seconds for reaction. You can still react as I'm speaking. Uh, if not, then I guess we can probably just uh, do a quick wrap up. I guess, Daphne, since I asked you the question already, I think you probably have highlighted the points. But are, are there any like one last or two last key takeaways that you want us to really focus on? This is, you know, what we really want uh, the participants to take away from from this. So I'll go to Daphne first and then I'll go to Edmund. I think that uh... I uh, just want to share my take home message for myself is the, the word um, make things shareable, shareable. Because I think we talk about the internet users. Um, uh, we have different uh, wide range of internet users, uh, including those in the uh, less um, developed countries. And we're talking about how to open up or um, share internet infrastructure. And then in terms of energy sector, we need to share the power grid, making it more accessible for renewable energy. And for data sets, we need to share, build shareable data platforms. So I think um, for me, I, this is the take home words for me. Thanks, Stephanie. And Edmund, final words to you. What are the key takeaways you want us to focus on? And the uh, floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. And uh, I, I cannot agree with uh, uh, Daphne more. Um, in fact, I was quite surprised coming into, um, you know, coming out of this session to find that um, uh, it's there, the, it, as, as Teddy mentioned, uh, there are so many levels of, uh, um, you know, sharing that that's important. Um, and I, I, you know, when, when we did the study, we, we, felt that, um, you know, uh, the, a, a better sharing of the, the network capacity uh, would actually help. And, and, you know, now we found out that um, with, with the session, uh, what Teddy uh, uh, and, and also Daphne presented realized that, you know, how, how important it is for, for different levels of sharing as well. And I think for, as the internet community, I think that's what we do best, right? I mean, that's when the, um, internet is built on a, a shared kind of uh, a trust. And I think um, this is something that, that's useful. And in terms of takeaway, I think um, uh, uh, for, for us, it's realizing um, the, uh, not only the sharing, but also that it's not so much sometimes about uh, this, this whole um, kind of uh, clickbait uh, uh, ad advocacy about the internet is occupying a huge, uh, uh, carbon footprint, it, it is a, a occupying and increasing uh, carbon footprint, and it is important to, to look at the, the, the power that powers the internet, but it's also about what it, it, uh, it would replaces and what we can do with the internet to, to, to advocate, um, you know, for the power grid uh, uh, and the, uh, the, the grid emission uh, factors uh, and improvement in the, that. And that's really what, um, you know, I think uh, our our key finding is from from at least from this pilot study, and hopefully as we expand, we we can uh, 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 you know find more insights as well. And um, just before I close, I, I I invite you know for for those of you who would be willing to, or interested to follow our work, uh, we you can check in on. Um, EcoInternet.Asia. Uh, it's a coming soon site right now, but um, it connects to the uh, Ajitora initiative that we have been running since 2016. Uh, so please, uh, you know, you can check out uh, EcoInternet.Asia um, uh, to connect and also follow up, uh, follow our work. Thank you, Edmund. I think um, thank you for also the link to the site EcoInternet.Asia. We'll hope to also get 
uh, of course, with permission, uh, the the studies that the presentations from all the speakers today. I think Teddy had a really interesting slide that I also need to read a little closely on, especially to do with policy recommendations. I think a lot of this is really food for thought for us. There's a lot of opportunities for us to work together. I mean, this is after all why we're here at the Internet Governance Forum. Um, our Nepal delegate who has left the room but has mentioned, you know, there's a lot of work being done elsewhere in bigger uh, uh, forums and bigger meetings than right here at the IGF, but it is crucial that we talk about climate change here. It is very crucial that we talk about sustainability here because the internet touches every single part of our lives. And, and it's very interesting. I, I want to actually bring up one more time is when Teddy mentioned there is the social justification of this. When we're looking at developing countries, when we're looking at the least developing countries, oftentimes people think there's a choice between, okay, is it a better internet or better opportunities or is it, are we going to try to save the environment? And it's never that choice. It's always how to find the balance to move forward in the, the most optimized way. But that also requires cooperation from everyone, from all the stakeholders, from all the sectors, public and private as well. The conversation does not stop here, as in the chat. And I've also you know, pulled up, there is a lot of work being done, even just here in the IGF ecosystem. There's the policy network on environment. We have our, you know, uh, .Asia has um, the, the, the EII. And of course, uh, A for AI has their studies on, you know, uh, looking at affordable accessibility as well. So I welcome everybody who wants to be part of this conversation to help us to identify uh, more areas we can look at, to identify more countries we can take a look at, and to actually help us to, to work together. Because it's not only just, you know, trying to advocate for, uh, to, to, to ask the governments to look into greener energy grids. It is also actions that we can take ourselves and our, our personal responsibilities too. So conversation doesn't end here. And we welcome, of course, you to join us uh online join us online to to further these efforts thank you so much for your time and i'm wishing you all the rest of a really good uh internet governance forum here in poland and also online thank you very much okay, thank you